Hey guys, welcome to the channel. I hope you enjoy this mono recap. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks. The roar leaves everyone speechless as Camus tries to get a word out. Vikir grabs her mouth shut because they can't make loud noises. The beast has poor eyesight but makes up for it with its elite hearing. Back in the past, Vikir remembers a native tell him about the incidents that occurred because of this monster. The tale seemed like a twisted horror story. Even the Empire's Monster Dictionary finally settled on a name, Madam Eight Legs. Risk rating, S. A monster capable of destroying a nation. The beast spreads its jaws and lets out venom in all directions. Fakir dodges while Adolf shields himself and Camus, and one of the barbarians gets hit and starts to scream. But luckily, it was only on his hair. Ayen cuts off the hair before it spreads, scolding the idiot for raising his voice. She looks up at this towering spider and the situation looks dire. The two groups quickly signal their parties to retreat, but the madam is keen on their positions and notices the group splitting away. The slight difference in how the two groups retreated gave the beast a decision on who to chase. And of course, she's chasing our boy. Idiot mage number one tries to prepare a fire spell and he connects with the target. As he basks in his own confidence, the man is pierced through the chest mid-sentence. Idiot mage number two shoots his pants after what just happened and starts screaming, despite the fact that this monster can only hear. Camus, Adolf, and Vakir are still running, seemingly not worried about the guys behind him, and Vakir thinks to himself that this is it. He turns around telling Stafford that someone needs to hold the monster back, or they will all die. Stafford tries to volunteer, but Vakir tells him that his skills won't be enough, and the person best suited to do this is Vakir. He draws his sword as the group watches him step towards certain death. Camus is left speechless, and Adolf is urged to continue running. With teary eyes, they leave the scene, and Adolf is his nephew well. Camus cries out and wishes he returned safely. The group goes out of sight, and Vakir relaxes. It's not helpful to his plans for this beast to destroy his territory, and this is an excellent opportunity for him, if he can fake his own death. He can get out of Hugo's watchful eye, and get some time to perfect his skills. And when he is ready, he will return to the clan. Fakir harnesses his aura and draws Beelzebub. If he doesn't use all of his power, he might die. Fakir is going to use everything he has to slay this beast. He dashes in faster than the eye can see and leaps into the air. The two lock eyes and Fakir gathers all of his energy into Beelzebub. A light flashes and Fakir unleashes the Baskerville fifth technique. Fakir is drawing every ounce of his power and the madam is forced onto the ground. The light is so bright that Camus can see it while running away, but feels that the love of her life will not come back, and screams his name. Vakir reliving his first death by the guillotine, reaffirming his quest for vengeance. As the dream fades, he wakes up in a mysterious tent, and he's bandaged and wounded. He has no idea how many days have passed, and wonders if he even survived the battle. If he used any less power in his attack, Madame Eight Legs would have killed him on the spot. Vakir rises, still reeling in pain, and realizes that he's still far too weak. And this is the result. He notices a rope wrapped around his neck and thinks on the situation. Everything technically is going according to plan. He got Hugo off his back and there are so many witnesses to confirm what happened. Fakir exits the tent and is in the barbarian village, the Balak camp. He wonders if he's being held captive. He knows he can get away, but right now he is too injured to do so. He overhears slaves behind shoved into the camp and they're being mocked and ordered to move quickly. Vakir knows their faces, but wonders why he isn't in chains. Ahun comes to greet Vakir and asks if he can speak their language. He tells him that he should be thankful. He won't end up like his comrades. But then the mood turns darker, as Ahun gets into Fakir's face, asking him how it feels to watch his comrades walk towards their deaths. And he can't do anything about it with his crippled body. And if he wasn't Ayen's pet dog, he would have been boiled alive. Pet dog was a wrong word to say to Vic, as all the pent up rage of years of anger built up inside of him. Ahun gets taken aback but quickly punches Vakir and storms off. Vakir remembers his face and when he recovers, he will be sure to pay him back. Vakir is following the rope his neck is tied to and it's long as hell since he walked for like a couple miles and it still isn't at the end. Finally, he sees his destination and Ayen is neck deep inside of a small pond. The two lock eyes and suddenly Ayen yanks a rope holding Vakir's neck and makes him dodge an incoming arrow. Ayen orders the brats who shot that to train somewhere else. She gets out of the water and thanks Vakir for freeing her from the slave auction. In their tradition, they return kindness twofold and revenge tenfold. And she already saved Vakir twice. How was it twice? Ayen says the first time was when she risked her life going back to rescue him from Madame Eight Legs, and the second time is when she healed him and kept him safe from the other barbarians. Vikir questions the rope and asks why he's being kept alive, and Ayen playfully tugs at the rope again, saying Vikir looks valuable. 
and she wonders how much money his clan would pay for his return. This is not good. Fakir's whole plan will be ruined if this goes through. What can he do in this situation? Ayan smiles, laughing at what she thinks is a sense of hope to return home. She tells Vakir that he won't be let go that easily, and she's gonna make him her slave. She draws her sword and tells Vakir to call her master, and she likes the look that he has in his eyes. She sheaths her sword again, and has somewhere to take Vakir first. They're going to greet the village head, and we see this absolute savage on her throne of slain beasts the matriarch. Vakir and Ayan continue controlling the camp and she explains the nature of the village. People aren't caught up on material things and he can sleep where he wants and eat where he wants and that's just how the Baloks live. It's very different from how the so-called civilized clans do. It feels homey to her and Vakir will get used to it. Soon after they arrive at the matriarch's tent and Ayan opens the tent and refers to the matriarch as mother, alerting Vakir to their relationship. First thing this woman does is spill the beans on how much Ayan has been talking about Vakir. The whole time the young hound is trying to analyze the situation and this is the famous night fox the one who injured his father. Fakir wonders what would have happened if he fought her in his past life and comes to the conclusion that he has a 0% chance of killing her head to head and a 0% chance of assassination and even running away would only leave him with 20% success rate. As the Night Fox's menacing aura floods into Fakir's mind as she's eyeing him up, she thinks that she has seen his face before. Fakir is concerned that she might find out that he is Hugo's son, but she just says that all Imperials look the same and he could be anyone. The matriarch doesn't see value in this boy and doesn't know why her daughter even likes him, but Ayan protests that Vakir is only injured, due to fighting Madame Eight Legs. The Night Fox doesn't seem too impressed, but as long as his seat is good, doesn't matter how damaged his body is, and Ayo, hold up, our boy's married, wait a second, what, what is she talking about? Ayan clears up the situation saying she plans to use Vakir as a slave, which doesn't make much difference to her mother. She tells her to do whatever she wants, it is her slave after all. But in reality, we do know that Ayan has feelings for our boy. Some time passes and they are seen walking in the forest and Vakir asks a question. So, what, what's your name? After all this time, he never really knew, and he doesn't intend on calling her master. Ayan gets startled and protests since a slave can't ask questions like that, but blushes and introduces herself as Ayan. Vakir returns the greetings and asks what she wants to do with him, further embarrassing Ayan. She regains her composure and gives her first order to build a house that he will live in. She thinks to herself that this is the perfect way to train an arrogant slave. There's no way this spoiled imperial brat knows how to construct the house. Vakir knows exactly what Ayan is trying to do and is thinking of how he can execute this task to set the balance between them off. He gets an idea and smiles and in a short amount of time, Ayan returns to Vakir's perfectly built tent, leaving her impressed. He did this even while injured, and Ayan's simp ass even brought him some materials to help. Fakir thinks that it's been a while since he had to do this, but this was one of the basic skills he needed to have as a hound, executing orders for Hugo. He would need to survive in the most extreme environments. Ayan even notices the perfect drain that he'd constructed to control the rain flow. And Fakir cuts her off saying that her mother's tent looked uneven and starts giving her a detailed explanation on why and wants to actually fix it. This whole conversation leaves Ayan stumped and faking that she understands so she can agree. Fakir starts showing his husband qualities while Ayan watches and he hand delivers a set of bricks to the matriarch and fixes her tent by reinforcing the center log. He does this to avoid swaying and any leaking and the matriarch is impressed. And now Fakir was ordered to go around and help the village with matters like this. So it looks like he created more work for himself. The next day comes and Vakir is seen doing some laundry and Ayan just bluntly asks him if he's not bored doing all these menial tasks. Doesn't he want to be an official member of the tribe? Vakir declines saying that slaving away like this is actually more peaceful than the life he had before. And Ayan is slightly happy because she thinks her slave training is working and it's not. This man was literally tortured since birth. She still tries to convince Vakir to join her tribe and if he listens to her maybe she'll untie the rope. Fakir pretends to be interested and asks what he has to do, and is told that he needs to hunt a huge prey. In recent times, the Balak warriors haven't been able to catch large enough prey so the children have been not eating properly. So if you can help with that problem, it would help Fakir get acceptance into the tribe. She smacks Fakir on the back saying how easy it will be and he should be grateful for this opportunity. He bites his lip and agrees which makes Ayan light up, and she tells him that they are leaving tomorrow. And it seems that someone is watching these two lovebirds with disgust, and it's none other than Ahun. We are introduced to a new character and it's an old man who is sinking his hand into a bowl of charcoal. He tells the young ones to gather around and it's time for the ceremony. This is the Balak's shaman, Ahuman, and he gives his blessing to each of the warriors. And the reason for this is because Balak hunters feel guilt when killing their prey. So he uses this charcoal powder to hide them from the god of death. 
The warriors seem to have negative opinions of this so-called shaman, since his blessing does fail a lot of the time, but it can't seem to not keep up the tradition. Fakir overhears this commotion and assumes this shaman has no real influence in the village. We see the amazing face painting job the shaman did for Ayan, and Vakir joins in, making fun of her. She brushes it off with her hand and tells Vakir to wear this, and hands him this kinky ass spiked collar. He doesn't seem to care and puts it on, and Ayan brings him along to ride her wolf. She tells him to hold her waist so he doesn't fall off, but Vakir declines. But as soon as the wolf takes off, he immediately eats shit. Vakir just wonders if his broken bones will even allow him to get up right now. Vakir looks up and sees Ahun, who's looking pretty saucy right now. And he calls out to Ayan, telling her to stop playing around with this slave and to come with him instead. This time, he will be the one to catch the biggest prey, and will be the captain, to impress his grandfather. Ayan doesn't seem interested and questions why he's even doing this, but this just makes him angry, and he takes that anger out by kicking Vakir in the face. And what the hell did our boy do? Damn. He is sent flying back, and Ahun tells Ayan that he's disgusted that she gave him the protection necklace, and she can't go on a hunt with this trash slave. She's only ruining her reputation. Ayan is stressed at first, but smiles knowing Vakir is in a pushover, and tells this baboon to check his waistband. Vakir gets up spitting out blood and tells Ahun to take better care of his weapons. Treat it how you would treat your lover. Ahun is enraged that Vakir stole his waistband and rushes to finish him off, but is grabbed by the shoulder with Ayen telling him that that is enough. Whose slave does he think he is punishing? Ahun tries to protest that a slave cannot be allowed to embarrass a warrior, but Ayan just says that he was being pathetic and only embarrassed himself. Ahun gets to his real feelings and shouts that surely Ayan doesn't have affection for this slave, right? Ayan just face palms and says that a slave must be punished if they did something wrong. But still, it is her slave. Vakir wonders what is about to happen, but yet again he is rocked in the mouth, this time by Ayan, with blood splattering across the grass. Ahun is shocked and Ayan stares at him menacingly, asking if he's happy now, with blood still dripping from her fingers. She warns him to never touch her slave again, or he will be punished. Ahun gets the message and leaves, and turns back into a simp moments after, asking if Fakir's okay. She had to do that to get Ahun off their backs. Fakir just says his face hurts, and Ayan immediately jumps around on the wolf to see if he's okay. Are you going to die? she asks. Fakir finishes his line saying that it only hurts to talk, but he should be alright, but interrupting him is a kiss from Ayan. Even this hard ass Baskerville hound can't be emotionless from love like that, and is taken aback. Ayan blushes and turns back around and continues riding her wolf. She changes the conversation saying that even though Vakir is an imperial, he does show some promise. But Vakir is still trying to understand what just happened, and actually thinks what Ayan just did could spread an infection, and Vakir is kind of a bonehead for real. Ayan turns around and tells Vakir that if he needs anything that she can do, she will do it. And Vakir immediately asks for something. He pauses for a second and Ayan starts to assume the worst case scenario. And Vakir says if it's anything, then he would like her to teach him how to use a bow. Ayan gets disappointed because it wasn't a sexier request, but still agrees. And tomorrow, she will start his special training. We shift right into Vakir's training and he's being humbled by the fact that he has little talent for this endeavor. Ayan starts getting close, adjusting his position, teasing the young hound, since he needs to learn to not be able to use a sword for a while, and this is the only way he will be able to catch the huge prey. She continues adjusting his posture, which pushes Vakir's bones. The wolf approaches with something that she asked for. She releases Vakir, and he immediately falls to the floor, grabbing his back like some type of old man. But he gets no time to rest, however, as Ayan tells him to get up. From here on out, the training will move more quickly. They move to a new location and overlook a stream of water that connects a river to an ocean. And she tells Vakir that in this area, there are many animals that live off this water. She tells Vakir that her grandma once told her that these salmon who can swim up the waterfall can evolve into huge beasts. But those that fall plunge into the earthen spikes and become food for ox bears. Vakir spots an ox bear and he thinks that this is completely different from the imprisoned ones that he fought in the academy and will be a much harder foe. An ox bear from a superior bloodline. Vakir wonders if his job is to capture the menacing female ox bear, but is told that their real goal is to go for the male bears that try to mate with her. We see the primal meeting between the bears and two males approach, but they are slapped around by the female, alerting Vakir to this arrangement, and he thinks the female will reject males that are too weak. Ayan says that his thinking is wrong and it's actually the opposite. The female isn't looking for the strongest male, but actually the weakest one, as a pathetic looking red bear comes and steals the female. Vakir is speechless at what he is seeing, but Ayan explains that the reason for this is that strong males can get excited easily and oftentimes they kill their partners. So for female ox bears, this is the best choice. And this is also how Balak warriors select their partners as well. 
and it doesn't matter how weak one is as long as the DNA is fine. And DNA is code for those little white tadpoles. I can't with this tribe, man. What's going on? This whole arc of the story has been wild. Anyways, now all they need to do is wait. Vakir has been waiting for four days, listening to the bear's mate, and is completely annoyed at what he's being made to do. Ayan approaches and asks if he left food for the bears like she requested. Vakir says he did and he's been giving them food every day so they can continue doing their thing. Ayan inspects the fruit that they've been giving and it turns out this fruit increases one's strength at the expense of their lifespan. Vakir is still annoyed with her plan, but Ayan prepares some soup for the young hound to eat so he can heal up faster. Vakir asks if mating that often is normal, but Ayan says that it is in her tribe, which makes Vakir almost gag on his soup. Ayan just assumes that Imperial males don't get it on like that and starts teasing Vakir. And right before this conversation could go any further, some noises are heard from the cave. The female ox bear has been impregnated and exits the cave, and roars menacingly. This is a signal to the male to never come back. And now, the real hunt begins. After eating and mating for four days straight, the bear will retreat to rest, and this is the perfect opportunity for them to attack. The two ride into a frozen environment, and Vakir questions why the bear is traveling so far. But the ox bear has a high intelligence, and this is the only place it can be to feel truly safe. Vakir starts getting cold because of his body's condition, but Ayan tells him to bring his body close to hers. He rejects at first, but Ayan tells him that if he becomes stiff due to the cold, it's only going to negatively affect their hunt. Vakir appreciates the reasoning and is actually impressed, and proceeds to hug Ayan from behind, making her simp ass blush, pretending that she'd offered that for her slave's health. Bakira smells the bear and out of the corner of Ayan's eye, she spots the beast waiting for them in an ambush. It leaps from the cave right at the two with claws ready to take their heads off. We shift back to the tribe and Ahun got a pretty large sized boar and everyone is impressed which strokes his ego. And now all the people in the tribe think that he will be the new hunting captain. And he thinks to himself that this will sure put Vakir in his place and he eagerly awaits his return. Back in the frozen landscape the bear's claws barely miss Ayan's face. Vakir grabs her waist and throws the two off of the wolf's back, barely escaping the strike. Bakira growls and begins to attack the bear and Ayan thanks Vakir for saving her. Vakir questions this monster's intelligence to lay a trap for them like this. It's amazing. And now he understands why the female is so picky. The two cannot avoid a head-on battle and Ayan thinks that she cannot let Vakir save her anymore or she's gonna lose respect as her master and orders him to step back as she fights the bear. Vakir sits back thinking if the slave should really just relax while the master is doing all the work, but Ayan is riding Bakira jumping through the air, pelting the bear full of arrows. She will make this thing pay for interfering with her slave. The bear tries to hide behind an ice block, but Ayan isn't discouraged. She charges her aura into an arrow, and this technique can pierce even steel, but only works this way, and cannot even pierce a leaf unless it's hiding behind another object. The arrow flies which leaves the ice block in one piece, but the bear is struck making it cough up blood. Fakir is shocked at what he just witnessed. The wave of aura from the arrow passed through the block into the bear. What precision. This kind of archery can be called art. Being able to hunt one's prey without any flaws. It seems our boy's opinion of Ayan went up, and he thinks that her skills can even rival Camus's. The ox bear is bleeding heavily and in the last ditch effort rushes in at Ayan. She prepares her final attack, an arrow that can even break a castle wall, and fires a huge beam of light, but the beast manages to dodge and only its horn is broken. Ayan is shoved off of her wolf to the ground and she begins tumbling across the ice. She recalls her mother's teachings that a beast that is close to death can sense one's killing intent, and this mistake could cost her her life. Ayan was careless, and now she is weaponless right in front of this wounded ox bear. She closes her eyes ready to accept death, but Vakir whispers into her ear if she is done trying to show him this so-called master's dignity, because now it's his turn. As he readies his arm, throwing it into the bear's head, and as he is reaching his target, he unsheaths Beelzebub. Fire emerges from the tip, completely cooking the bear, finishing it off. But it's just as Vakir expected. This skill was too much for him to use, and immediately faints. The two return to camp, and a huge festival is thrown. The one who catches the largest prey earns the respect of the village. Ayan asks Vakir how it feels to be the hunting hero. Vakir just answers emotionless like he always does and Ayan says that that's his problem. The ox bear isn't just strong but also smart, so everyone here knows the talent needed to catch prey like this. It's much different from a boar that's stupid and sluggish, as she looks over at Ahun rubbing it in his face. Ahun hands Vakir a bowl of food and Vakir just wonders why there isn't a lot of meat. Ahun just protests that he's a slave and this is how much his honor is worth. 
but the tradition of the hunt is the one who contributes the most eats the least amount, and in return he gains the most honor. Vakir doesn't understand this backward logic and is really hungry, but he can't be too mad, because food isn't what he wanted to gain from this hunt. He fed Bizzlebub another rank A monster in the Ox Bear, and also tried out the Cerberus skill Flame. And he has gained a new skill, 600 kilogram hammer. And not only that, after feasting on the bear, Fakir recovered a lot. Ayan drew another bowl full of intestines, which makes him sick to look at. But Ayan tells him to eat this because it's important for his recovery. Ayan is getting teased by the other girls and Vakir decides to give it a try. He eats up and Ayan has a bright smile, and says now that he's recovered, he can fulfill his duties. Vakir just thinks, like what more could this chick possibly want from him at this point? But now the two arrive at a large tree stump, with acid residue from Madame Eight Legs. The reason the tribe is going through a food shortage is because they have to offer a large amount to the madam. This is an offering to live in the forest. And now Vakir understands why they were acting with such fear around the monster. The next day comes and a huge line is seen outside of Vakir's tent. Vakir wonders what's going on and is there some sort of ceremony, but the line is full of all the girls. They talk about yesterday's hunt and I can assume all this chatter is related to Vakir. Ayan comes back and is angry with what she is seeing. She tells all the girls to back off of her slave and go catch their own, but all of them just argue that she always hogs everything for herself. And I'm very, very jealous of Vakir right now, like can I be captured please? I'm ready. Ayan puts on a murderous face that scares off all of the women and Vakir appears right behind her, overhearing what she said about the ox bear stew that she gave him. In reality, it wasn't intestines, but rather a bear Johnson. And the reason he was fed this was to help him perform in bed. Man, what is going on in this story arc right now? What the hell? Vakir hears everything and is disgusted at what he found out. Ayan changes the conversation telling Vakir that he will soon meet with the matriarch and be able to request something from her, as the most honorable hunter. Vakir changes up his clothes to look like a tribesman and walks into the matriarch's tent and greets her. She thanks him for catching the ox bear and is impressed with his recovery. It's astonishing that he's almost back to full strength. Fakir thanks her for his treatment in the camp and he thinks to himself that the night fox Akilla is a genius warrior who scares off the empire while only having a tribe of around 300. Her strength is equal to Hugo's, yet her personality is soft and warm. Akilla wants to reward Vakir and as such makes him a part of the family. The shaman coughs in disagreement and Vakir remembers that Ayan told him that the elders were not happy about this change. Akilla stands up and tells Vakir that he can have one request of her and reaches out her arm, asking what the young hound wishes to have. Vakir looks over towards Ayan, hand signaling him to say what they talked about and he sighs and tells Akilla that he does have one request in mind, to bathe in the hero's spring. Everyone is taken aback and Akilla's warm demeanor changes into a menacing stare, wondering if Fakir knows what he is asking. The shaman and his dipshit grandson start protesting the request, saying that only heroes that have proved their strength can use the spring. They won't stand here and witness this arrogance. Again is obviously on our boy's side, but her mother just coldly looks at him and asks if he knows what he's truly saying. Vikir confidently answers that he does, and the hero's spring is a shrine that only the strongest Balak warriors are allowed to go into, that acts as a hot spring, that has both internal and external healing properties. The water takes a long time to accumulate, hence the reason for only the strongest to bathe inside of it. Other elders start chiming in their thoughts, and no one seems to like the idea of Vakir entering the shrine. Akila thinks on it for a moment and actually wants to grant Vakir his request, but she's in a bad spot since most of the elders disagree, so it looks like she will have to decline for now. But interrupting her train of thought is a bell sounding outside. Ayan alerts Vakir that there's some guests, and this matter will be postponed. But the shaman has an evil stare at Vakir as he's exiting the tent. They go outside to spot a caravan carrying supplies entering the village, and it's a group of merchants that Vakir recognizes as the Bourgois family. And for them to get here, it would mean they crossed the morgue or Baskerville territory. Normally, unless they smuggle themselves in. The merchants start unveiling the products and all the barbarians gather around. They're bartering daily essentials for rare materials, and they're using the Balaks who have no knowledge of market prices. Fakir doesn't want to butt in since this is something for the tribe to figure out for themselves, but quickly after, Ayan starts protesting a deal. There's no way a diamond can be exchanged for a corn. Fakir is happy that someone has brains inside of this village, but is quickly reminded that she is no better as she asks for two corns. This is the same story for all of the Balaks and they are hopelessly swindled. A little girl approaches a merchant asking for a glass orb, and the man asks for what she has in exchange. 
She shows a nutritious bug and the merchant becomes disgusted and smacks it out of the girl's hand, thinking the only value that she has is as a slave. Vikir can't stand idly by any longer, and he tells the merchant that his trades are invalid. The merchant tries to take back what he said, but Vakir understood every word and translated it for everyone to hear. He demands that he cancels every unfair trade that he has made today. The man protests, but Vakir tells him that he damn sure knows the values of the items that he is trading for. The merchant gets in Vakir's face, asking if he really knows what he's talking about. And this is a sacred trade. Vakir is getting tired of this and just brings up one example. The diamond you just received goes for about 2 million gold, and the corn you traded it for is about 100 gold each. If you grind an ox bear horn into a billiard ball, it's about 1 million. The merchant is shocked on Vakir's market knowledge, and the orbs that the merchant is selling is a cheap drug meant to get one hooked on sweet dreams, but is very harmful in long-term use, and is illegal inside of the empire. Vakir crushes the orb, and now the barbarians are aware of what's taking place. The merchants try to hightail it out of there, but Ayan quickly lets off an arrow, stopping them in place. The merchants begin to run again, and Ayan actually lets them go, and this is one of her hunting tactics. Merchants rarely accept a loss, so they'll be back sooner than later. They have a tendency to regroup with their pack when injured. The merchants return to their mercenary group that was transporting them, and the battle is about to commence. Nighttime comes, and an eagle sits on Ayan's shoulder, and now it is time for one thing only, slaughter. The leader of the mercenary group starts laughing at the merchant, saying how talking with the barbarians is useless, and the only thing to do is hunt them and turn them into slaves. The merchant actually says something smart, warning the mercenary not to underestimate the Balaks, especially in their territory, but the mercenary obviously is doing the exact opposite, and thinks dealing with some savages should be easy. And anyways, they were hired for this exact reason. Their part of the deal was to split the earnings, and now that it's been stolen, everything is up for grabs. Right? The man hands a merchant a cigarette, but he declines, telling him to do as he pleases. The mercenary says his plan is to sneak on them at night and set a fire and ambush them. As he's explaining his genius strategy, his lackeys start fighting over a match. They fight over the match until one of the bozos is sniped in the forehead, talking about what he would do with the barbarians that he captured. Soon after, even the mercenary leader is quickly dealt with, leaving the merchant leader in a deep despair. He orders his men to extinguish the cigarettes and Ayan orders her troops to continue firing. Vicky watches on and is impressed that something as subtle as a light cigarette bud was enough for a Balak warrior to pinpoint their target. A man approaches Vakir saying he's prepared what he has asked for. The mercenary group tries to regain their composure and regroup, and all their mages help them block the arrows. All of a sudden, two arrows with a rope tied between them, carrying the barrel that Vakir was holding, flies right above the group. The arrows delve inside of the nearby trees, and more barrels are fired, leaving many of them above the mercenary group. Realization hits them as these are alcoholic barrels, and another volley of arrows sets them ablaze. The mercenaries are decimated and the flames engulf the forest. The lead merchant falls back cursing these Balaks, just when did they become so smart? But in typical fashion of RMC, he lurks behind him. The merchant notices him, and this man is the one who caused everything. If it wasn't for him, the trade would have went smoothly. Ironically, what this guy pulls out of his ass is an official seal, from the new deputy consul of Underdog. And if he is killed, the Baskervilles will come after him. Fakir questions if he's talking about the new young deputy consul, the Baskerville child, and the man agrees. This enrages Vakir since he never remembered authorizing anything. Realization sets in for the merchant, but before he can speak, he is lit up with arrows, ending his life. And hold up, can we talk about how the mercenary's plan was to ambush and set fire to the barbarians and like, seconds after he said it, it was used right against them? I thought that was pretty funny. Anyways, those who forged the Baskerville seal will be executed. Ayan approaches from behind telling Vakir that it's time to go. The remnants of the mercenaries are relieved since the barrage of arrows stopped and they think that the enemy is retreating, but what is coming for them now is much worse, as the branch from Madam Eight Legs sprouts from behind them and quickly deals with these invaders. Ayan is impressed with Vakir's plan to use fire and bait out the rank ass monster. What a great Balak he has become. After this display, Vakir is granted access to use the Hero Spring. It's hard to protest his achievements now, as the elders bow in agreement. Ayan is ordered to take Vakir to the spring, and Ahumen is enraged since he said the reason the villagers were getting sick was because they were cursed, and not from the drugs, and his influence suffered due to this. But Vakir remembers what the merchant said, and it seems a shaman was in on the whole scheme. Nighttime comes and enters the hero's spring, but he notices his mana becoming more purified, and his bones and muscles healing. Vakir thinks that the elders were making a fuss for no reason. Although this is not as effective as the Styx River, it's better due to not having an age limit. But one thing was bothering Vakir at that moment. Why is Ayan here bathing with him? 
She tells Vakir to thank Adonai for finding this hot spring, and we get some backstory on this absolute Chad that supposedly fought Madame Eight Legs and is one of the strongest Balak warriors. Fakir gains some respect for him since anyone who stands up to that thing deserves it. Ayan sinks into the spring looking at thinking of what her mother told her. Vakir is a good man and a worthy one to be her husband and she vows to herself to make him hers. Ayan says that she always knew the merchants were up to something shady and she always had a vague idea so she's happy they had the chance to get back at them. If Vakir didn't point it out she would have sooner or later. Vakir just laughs at this since she traded a diamond for two pieces of corn and asks the girl how much corn does she think a diamond is worth? 20? 30? The real number is given to her which makes her stand up in shock. She lies again saying that she knew that too but is obviously full of shit. She just doesn't understand the value that a stone has. But Vakir changes the conversation asking Ayan on what she wants to call him, slave or by his real name. Ayan thinks about it for a while and readies herself, approaching Vakir and grabbing his chin. What she really wants to call him is... But before she can say anything, a group of cock-blocking kids jumps into the pond, interrupting this romantic moment. Vakir thinks about what just happened and I'm sure he's still absolutely clueless on Ayan's intentions. Meanwhile, Ayan curses the brats for jumping in the water. They're reducing the potency of the effects by at least 50%. Vakir just laughs and Ahun says it was the matriarch's order to bring the children still feeling the effects of the drugs. Ayan curses her mother for this and Ahun has a redeeming moment actually, thanking Vakir for helping his little sister, and apologizes for how he has been acting towards him. Vakir doesn't answer and Ahun gets upset again and asks him if that's all he has to say. Vakir just tells him that he has too much anger in him, and Ayan just watches on and laughs and congratulates Vakir on becoming an official member of the Balak tribe. We time skip to about two years later and some dude is getting rocked in the face and it's none other than Ahun and Vakir is now 17 and it seems his strength is steadily growing. He calls Ahun a crybaby and ends the spar for today, despite his cries for a rematch. Ahun is helped up by two boys and they comment on how strong Vakir has become after being healed and his skill with the bow is on par with Ayan's at this time. And it turns out the punch that Vakir threw at Ahun didn't even connect with his face but stopped right before and the air pressure between the two objects caused a devastating strike. We see Vakir overlooking a huge wall saying that in these last two years he has perfected the sixth technique and we see cannon sized holes in the thick rock. He still has time before he can master the 10th technique but having mastered 6 in 17 years is more than he could have ever hoped for. He unsheathes bees and thinks that he also has 6 mana circles and right now he is a high rank graduator and after factoring in all of his other skills he can go toe to toe with the strongest of graduators. He reminisces on his times with the Balaks and once he's done his training he must leave. He reconnects with Ayan and they are tracking a forest snake. The village will be fed for 4 days. Ayan agrees but Vakir notices that she is distracted, asking her what is more important than the hunt right now. She blushes in her simp fashion and tells Vakir that she has something to ask him. He consents that she is hiding something but she pulls out a hunting dagger that was brought from an imperial that traveled deep in the forest and asks Vakir if it's familiar. He recognizes it as a famous emblem from a famous clan, Leviathan, a very prominent clan that is part of the seven that make up the empire alongside the Baskervilles. Ayan thought it was from a group of mercenaries they hunted but it was not. And this new group keeps venturing into the forest and pouring this mysterious red liquid into the rivers. The hunting group found one but the man ingested poison killing himself before he was questioned and the dagger is the only thing that was left behind. But Ayan also has another thing to ask and she asks Vakir if he wants to return home. It seems another group ventured into the forest, a fiery red haired mage and their objective is Vakir. Ever since he fought Madame Eight Legs, Camus has had a search party look for any clues regarding his whereabouts. Ayan's mind starts to fill with negative emotion, wondering how Vakir will act after finding this out. Vakir takes a deep breath and sighs. He doesn't even want to go back. Ayan lights up at the news and hugs Bakira. Vakir ponders that he assumed the Empire was aware that he was alive, but it turns out that there still isn't any proof. He can only return once he furthers his power and cannot be noticed until then. He also thinks the woman she is referring to has to be Camus, and Vakir just wonders if she's still not over the fact that he saved her. And seeing how the Baskervilles allowed her to enter the forest signifies how strong the relationship is between the two. Maybe the two families bonded over Vakir's death. He needs to investigate what is going on but all of a sudden a huge fish jumps out of the water onto the land in front of the two. It's gasping for air as liquid pours out of its mouth. 
Ayan thinks that this has something to do with the rainy season, but Vakir notices an arrow in the fish's back. He opens the fish and sees a corpse of a local ko, and Vakir and Ayan debate on how the sorcerer managed to be eaten by this lungfish. Vakir thinks that maybe something happened with the tribe and decides to investigate that first. They approach a small village and see many Lokoko members dead and rotting on the floor. They have signs of sickness, red dots, vomiting, and diarrhea. Ayan spots a fire towards the main village and the two check it out. They enter as nighttime approaches and there's still no sign of life. Ayan opens a tent and bugs rush out of the opening as she spots a corpse. Fakir analyzes the situation and there was an event in his past life. An epidemic ran through the jungle, the Red Death. It decimated the barbarian population, and the symptoms he is seeing matches up. The infection spreads quickly. Ayan starts to panic, telling Vakir that they need to leave, but he reassures her, letting her know that it's not contagious. The two argue back and forth, but Vakir deduces that due to the amount of corpses, there's a good chance that the tribe relocated somewhere to try and avoid the disease. He tells Ayan to stay put as he goes to check the barracks, but as soon as he leaves, a scream is heard behind him. Fakir quickly returns to see what's going on, and it seems Ayan is scared of a child, saying that it's a curse. Vakir approaches the young lady and notices that she isn't a member of this tribe, and is about 5 years old. He asks who this girl is, and the girl answers that she is a slave that works in the kitchen. Fakir asks for her name, and she says Pomeranian, which alerts Fakir to her imperial roots. And then, the real information hits him, as she says her last name, La Baskerville. There are three different middle names in the Baskerville clan. The branch houses are Van, and the main house is Le, and the rarest of them all is La and it's only given to females that come from the main house. It's rare because the clan is predominantly male, and Vakir is shocked. He doesn't remember anyone with that name from his past life, but she is wearing a necklace with the family emblem, as Ayan points out. He opens the pendant and sees that she is Hugo's daughter? The girl is trembling and Vakir asks how she is related to these people, but she is scared to respond. Ayan tells Vakir to ease up a bit since she's only a child and Vakir takes a second and realizes that he couldn't hold back his anger. And this child did nothing wrong. He calmly asks her the question again and she says in the picture is her mother and grandparents. Vakir gets a revelation to something Barrymore once told him, that Hugo used to have a gentle and loving personality with his first wife, Roxana, when she was still alive. And the tipping point in his life was when Penelope, his daughter, was taken away by the barbarians. The clan moved swiftly to find her whereabouts, and even the house of the clan was moved closer to the mountain. But in the end, Hugo was never able to find a trace of his daughter. And after years of torture and grief, this is how the clan ended up to what Vakir came to know. Hugo became a cold, calculated killing machine. Vakir never believed this tale, but the proof is right in front of him. Pomeranian is Hugo's granddaughter. Vakir wonders what kind of expression Hugo would have seeing his granddaughter, who has her blood mixed with the barbarians. Vakir pats the girl on the head, telling her to come with him. She points out that Vakir has the same hair and eyes as her mother, and Vakir says that they are technically related, so she can call him uncle. She looks towards a flower signaling her dead mother, and recalls some of her last words, to always trust someone with red eyes, and to follow that person. She agrees to go with him, and at this moment, two strays have joined together in this twist of fate. Some time passes and Vakir exits his tent, and Pomeranian comes out asking where he is going. Vakir needs to go to a meeting, but the girl is adamant on going with him. Vakir agrees, wondering if she's afraid to be alone, but is happy that she's opening up to him. He puts her on his back and knows it can't be helped. He can't raise her here though, he needs to find somewhere outside of Hugo's influence, and somewhere that has imperial teachings. Maybe he should ask Chihuahua for help. It seems Vakir needs to travel to the city for once. Vakir enters the matriarch's tent and informs her of the plague going around. She sees this as a threat and knows the damage that it will cause, with the wet season approaching. The shaman begins to protest that it's a curse, not a plague, and they can fix it with more offerings. Ayan disagrees since she saw it firsthand, and the only thing they can do is relocate to avoid the damage. The elders protest having to leave this sacred place, and they have been here for over 200 years. But the younger generation argues that their futures are more important than 200 years of history. The two sides begin to argue back and forth as the matriarch watches. Fakir thinks to himself that the Red Death was as deadly as the Black Death that caused irreversible damage to the Empire, and the only reason they were saved from it was due to Camus creating a wall of fire that stopped its spread, and the Saintess, Dolores, using her holy power to cleanse the area, and this only worked to protect the Empire 
the forest dried out and all the barbarians died. And in history, this was favorable to the Baskerville clan. Because after this happened, low rank demonic creatures started occupying the land and many civilians lost their lives. And the Baskervilles were contracted to hunt these creatures down. And in the end, they were successful in holding the border. And Hugo's influence grew. Vakir raises his hand and tells the matriarch that he knows a way to stop the Red Death. The barbarians are seen plunging a goblin into the river water, and the result is astonishing. The entire river is contaminated with the disease. They throw the goblin into the fire and it's just as Vakir predicted. The water is the biggest cause of the infection, but once boiled, it should be fine. Ion experiments by dumping a goblin in boiling water, but it just died instantly, causing Vakir to facepalm. Let it cool down first, moron. They redo the test and Vakir was right yet again, so the water situation is handled. The matriarch approaches thanking Vakir for his good work, and he lets to know that the disease cannot enter through the skin, but it can be inhaled, so be careful of any thick fog. Ayen pokes some fun at the shaman, and the shaman asks Vakir how he plans to avoid water when the wet season approaches, and it rains non-stop. Vakir says that it will be a bigger problem when the river overflows and the air becomes humid. There's limitations to what he can do, but the best thing is to relocate the village. The shaman starts screaming in protest, but says he has a plan so they can keep the Balak territory. Some time passes and the wet season begins, and the river flooded as predicted. The once flat lands turn into thick swamps. This time, however, the flooding was unlike anything the elders have ever seen, and the entire forest flooded into a thick, sea-like environment. Except for the Balak village, as we see the villagers pulling hard on a rope, and it seems they decided to build upwards and live higher along the trees. The villagers look up to Vakir now, and even after all this, the village still stands. As they praise his wisdom, Vakir thinks that this should be enough to last. Pomeranian begs to be held, but Vakir notices something in the water staring back at him, and all of a sudden, a huge water serpent emerges ready to eat two of the villagers. Ayan prepares an arrow of her own, hitting the large sea creature, saving her brethren, and Vakir wonders if this was the serpent they were hunting earlier. But this is the king of the serpents, Ka. The creature continues to struggle, destroying some of the homes, but Vakir unleashes Beelzebub and pierces the beast causing it to retreat back into the water. All of the villagers are amazed, and he is called the village hero. Ayen can't hold back her approval, and back in the tent, we see Pomeranian and Ayen enjoying some food. Telling Vakir his cooking is amazing, but the only thing on his mind is who invited Ayen into his house, and she can't just not come after smelling something so good. And Vakir is her slave after all. Pomeranian hears the two bickering back and forth, and just assumes that the two are a married couple. Ayan smiles and hugs Pomeranian since that is her goal after all, and all of a sudden someone enters the tent, and it's Ahun. He comes in crying saying he's come here to get Vakir's help. Please, my sister is sick, and it seems she has the red death. Vakir gets into Ahun's tent, asking when the disease started, and is told that it was only yesterday. She entered the swamp when they were doing some construction, and Ahul is the type of child to always help in some way. Ahun then enters the tent, disappointed in his grandson, but Ahun cries out that the only chance they have is to ask Vakir. The grandpa stands firm and says he will never trust Vakir, no matter what, and the family should have left this to him. He smacks Ahun, telling him to shut up, and tells him he's always been useless just like his parents. As he said, this is a curse from God. The answer is to carry out the ancestral rite. Ahun begins to cry, thinking there is no way out of this, but Vakir says that there's one thing that he can try. He orders Ahun to sanitize the furniture using boiling water and burn charcoal to chase out the bugs and bats in the tent. They need to create a sterile environment. Can you do that? Ahun gathers himself and goes outside to start this process. Vakir asks Ayan to do some help as well to bring him out of the deep forest. This shocks Ayan and she immediately protests that no way her or the matriarch will allow him to risk his life like this. Ahun overhears outside the tent, but Vakir continues that it is true the matriarch would give up on Ahul, but if everyone keeps it a secret, he can sneak out and return without anyone being the wiser. Vakir looks at Ayen and asks if she will let him go, and she has no choice but to accept. Vakir is traveling through the thick waters and Ayen is following. Vakir questions why she is coming with him, but she insists on coming. Ayen never questioned how Vakir knew about the Red Death or the sword that sprouts out of his arm, but she knew from the moment they met that she would give in to him. Memories of the two begin to show and she was afraid to ask one question, because if she did, Vakir would disappear once he answers, but she asks it anyways. 
Will you come back? Fakir says that he will, as Ayan watches him leave. Now, we see a shot of Chihuahua in his office, lamenting all the paperwork that he has to do. He opens the window, thinking how much he misses Fakir. And as he's lamenting his death, Fakir appears, as he always does, right in front of him. Chihuahua begins losing his mind, but Fakir just asks how the Secretary General has been doing. Some time passes and Chihuahua gets up to date with Fakir's life, and now knows he was hiding with the barbarians while treating his injuries. He's not convinced and wonders if Fakir is a ghost, but the young hound just sips his tea, wondering why Chihuahua is so shocked, even after all this time. He's still the same secretary general alright. Chihuahua begins crying uncontrollably but then regains himself, and asks about the child Vakir brought with him. Vakir says that this isn't his child despite appearances, but they are from the same bloodline, and he asks Chihuahua to look after her while he's gone, and to give her a good education. Chihuahua is excited to get another order from Vakir and eagerly agrees. Fakir tells the man that if he has trouble with his duty, seek out Cindy. Chihuahua wonders what she has to do with anything and how he can find her, but Fakir just asks if Chihuahua remembers Judy, the little girl who he gave 10 billion to. Cindy should be connected to her, since no one is supporting that child. And if she doesn't cooperate, just tell her that I am alive. Chihuahua smiles and understands his mission, but asks Fakir if he will be returning to his duty. But that young hound just smiles, saying that he will, once he finishes what he has to do. He has a promise to fulfill. Treating Red Death can be done with a single drop of holy water from a special clan, and that is what he needs to get. He exits through the window because chads don't use doors, and sets out on his adventure to the holy land of Quo Vadis. The next setting is two guards protecting a gate, and they raise their spears, asking to inspect a merchant who has horses carrying some oil barrels. The man shows a permit to the guards, and one of them wants to check what's inside one of the barrels. Despite the merchant's protest, the guard picks a barrel, and this makes the merchant nervously sweat. He thinks that that's the only barrel he didn't want them to see. But when the guard opens it up, he discovers only oil. He tells the merchant that he's good to go, and he is welcome to Saint Mecca. The merchant tells Vakir that he can come out now, and we see him pop out of the barrel with a nice disguise. But he's drenched in oil. The merchant asks if he can go now, because he did exactly what Vakir asked. Vakir agrees and hands the merchant an ox bear tooth as payment and walks off. The merchant is astonished that Fakir managed to be submerged in oil for over two hours. Fakir takes off his mask and lets loose while taking in a view, and he hasn't been under liquid for that long since the Styx River, and that was only for seven minutes. But at last, he finally got into the Quo Vadis clan's central city. With a population of 160,000, the church has a heavy influence here, so mortal desires are restricted, and even if a gold was lying on the floor, the citizens would walk right past it. Everyone strictly follows the rules. A bell rings above Fakir, alerting him to the time of day, which for these residents is when they go to pray. Fakir enters the crowd and wonders how they can live such a boring life. Now nighttime comes and Fakir goes to a local well and drops some purple liquid with a sample of Ahul's blood to infect the well with red death. This method is extreme but Fakir is in an urgent situation and every second is priceless. This is a holy territory, so they will handle the disease before it can spread. Three boys happen to stumble by Vakir and ask what he's doing by the well, and Vakir turns around and lets out some killing intent, telling the boys that this well is cursed. Anyone who drinks from it will die. The boys start shitting their pants and run off, thinking Vakir is some sort of ghost. Vakir plunges the dagger that he got from the Leviathan clan next to the well, since the clan is notorious for their poison, and by scaring off the kids, they will talk about it to other children, preventing the youth from drinking from this well. Vakir thinks the relationship between these two clans is already sour, so this might be some sort of breaking point. Vakir wonders if now he should visit the Saintus Dolores. We see a huge mansion, and citizens are flooding in to see the Saintus. They beg for the door to open just to get a glimpse of her face. The Saintus begins to speak, and three young lords try to impress her by getting her hand in marriage. She tells them to stop, even if they're handsome or wealthy, she won't open the gates for those type of reasons. She tells everyone to please leave, but Vakir stands in the crowd. Before Vakir died, he only saw the Saintus on the battlefield, desperately trying to save the injured, always covered in blood, and her divine aura always shined bright. Vakir approaches the door and the Saintus calls out to who is looking for her. Vakir drops to his knees and says he is a young lamb who has lost his way. After a moment, the door opens with a golden glow shining through, and Vakir is urged to come in. The Saintus voice echoes through a statue, asking how the lamb has lost its way. Vakir wonders if she's not going to meet him personally, maybe she's still suspicious. Vakir throws a water pouch saying he's found an epidemic in the slums and asks the Saintus to use her divine powers to check the wickedness from the water. But it seems it's not that easy to fool a saint, as she closes the door saying Vakir is a liar. 
trapping him in the room. The guards move to intercept and the leader appears on the next floor. The voice speaks that Vakir's voice is too aggressive to be a loss to Lam. The guard on the second floor asks who Vakir is and Vakir recognizes this man, Pietro Covadis. This man is who Vakir fought alongside with in the battlefield and he never compromises with injustice. And this man is more cruel than some demons. Vakir even learned interrogation techniques from him that he used on those poor teens from Underdog. Vakir in his disguise says he's glad to see Pietro still here, confusing him. He asks their weird guest why he has that strange attire and comes to report an epidemic. He asks Vakir to remove his mask and show some courtesy. Vakir declines saying that he's wearing this mask for a reason and can't take it off. But he only came here to warn the Saintus. His job here is complete, so he's going to be leaving now. As he turns around, Pietro opens his holy book. He won't let this suspicious man leave that easy. Vakir notices the page stuck in the wall commenting on Pietro's weird fighting style using divine power. The man jumps down to the first floor accusing Vakir of spreading the epidemic himself, but the young hound protests that if he really did spread it, why would he come here to tell them? Even though Pietro is completely right, the knight doesn't bend to his words. He says he will find out everything in his confession and uses his powers to send countless pages at Vakir. Vakir manages to dodge them with ease. Vakir can't fight him with full strength because if he shows his aura, the man might sense that he is a Baskerville. He vaults from the second floor and uses his momentum to go from the ceiling to land a devastating kick onto Pietro. The knight is caught off guard and the weight behind the attack is immense. The two back off and Vakir thinks that the skill he just used was a 600 kilogram hammer that he got from absorbing the ox bear. It was his first time using it and it's not too shabby. Vakir dashes back into Pietro and unleashes a barrage of punches, then gathers flames into his hands and uses the Cerberus' skill. He strikes at the knight, but it only puts his book ablaze. Vakir asks if he wants to continue, but Pietro isn't done just yet. He slams his fists together and he still won't let Vakir leave. He charges back in at him, but Vakir throws the burning book at his face, taking him off guard and gives him a heavy punch to the stomach, knocking him through the statue and leaving him unconscious. The soldiers are in awe that their leader was defeated and rush to defend him. The Saint disappears and asks everyone to stop. She asks if Vakir is lost and he takes off his mask. Kneeling, Vakir says that he is. The Saint says that Vakir is more like a puppy than a lamb, a puppy covered with injuries. The soldiers try to protest but the Saint tells them to fetch some tea. She has to talk with this person. We shift to this meeting and Vakir and the Saint are sitting across from each other and Pietro is standing as well. Vakir wonders if Dolores is 16 right about now, and in the future, during the demonic war, she treated countless patients on the front lines, and she truly embodied being a saint, and every martial artist who encountered her respect her deeply. She starts the conversation by saying she has been very stressed lately, and says she enrolled in the Imperial Academy, but right now she's on holiday, so she's taking some time to handle family affairs. Vakir is shocked that even she is talking about stuff like this. But the girl continues that as Vakir could see, all the nobles and merchants look for her all the time, and the illnesses they want her to treat are all after effects of narcotics or STD infections. There is not one person among them who is gravely ill. Righteousness and equality is God's will, but some people are blinded by greed. Vakir continues her thought by saying theology is essentially the process of understanding humans, so it's inevitable, taking Dolores by surprise. That was a quote from the Old Testament, and she is shocked that someone is aware of those old passages. Vakir says that the epidemic is ravaging the slums and this pouch has a sample. Dolores asks if Vakir has something to do with this, but again Vakir answers with the question, why would he come here if he is? But he can't avoid suspicion. He thinks he needs to try a different method and slides back his chair. Pietro gets alarmed and gets in front of the princess, but Fakir lets out some of his own divine energy, saying he doesn't like to harm people, especially since this is his hometown. Dolores is completely shocked that this man is a believer of Lund. And now Fakir has some leverage. He asks the girl if she will listen to him now. He spotted some strange people pouring liquid into the slum's wells, and they are the criminals. Dolores asks for the motive, but Vakir says whoever did it probably wishes for the decline of the Quo Vadis family, and the ones who benefit from that the most is the Leviathan clan, as well as the Borgwa family. The Leviathan clan will use this epidemic as an opportunity to get countless test subjects and use them as research. Furthermore, once the Divine Clan falls, only the Leviathans will be able to treat this disease, and they can use it as a weapon towards those the clan dislikes. Now for the Bourgois family, a lot has to be gained since once the population decreases, they will use that opportunity to buy a lot of the land to further enrich themselves. Vakir is certain that these two clans are working together, at least in the Barbarian's case. But right now, he tells Dolores that they are being used as scapegoats to benefit both parties. So due to those reasons, this is Vakir's hypothesis. 
This is why he brought this information to Dolores directly. The girl is shocked, wondering who on earth this is to be able to predict these events. Fakir just tells the two to call him Night Bloodhound. Dolores says that that's quite an ominous name and Pietro thinks it suits his blasphemous attire. Dolores says that everything that the Night Bloodhound said is quite plausible and thinks to tell Pietro to visit the slums and investigate this matter further. Fakir thinks to himself that he is happy with how this is progressing. Dolores looks and thinks how can this man who is so small and pitiful defeat Pietro and his holy knights. She senses the smell of a beast from his soul, blood, oil and steel and years of pent up anger. But within that whirlwind of emotion lies immense sadness. Just who is this person? Time passes and the Saintess arrives in the slums and the citizens are relieved that she is finally here. There's a terrible disease spreading. Dolores is shocked at what she is seeing and now she knows what Fakir was saying is true. Fakir stays in the back observing the scene, apologizing to his head to those that are sick. But thankfully there aren't any children. But this is only the start of the disease, so everyone should be cured easily. The Saintess begins her prayer and says the god Lun will save these people from their suffering. She sheds a tear and exudes immense divine aura into the church, and all of the people are healed. Everyone had just witnessed a miracle, and now Vakir needs to bring this miracle to the forest. Dolores is in her room trying to figure out the cause of this sickness. Her holy power is only temporary and can't stop new people from becoming infected. She needs to find the contaminated well. She has a sample of the virus and knows that it has a short incubation period, but takes a while until the actual infected person dies. The strength, however, is the causing of immense pain and it's very easy to spread. In order to fix this, she will need to focus on purifying the deepest well. She needs to create a drop of her power. She sighs and now is not the time for ideas and thinks she should go to treat more people. But all of a sudden, she is hit with an intense headache. She wonders if this is the price she has to pay for using too much divine power. Still, she is unfazed and has many more people to save. She exits the room with Pietro and we see the same three dipshit bachelors from before, begging to come along to help her. How can they leave the Saintess alone in a dirty place? They brought three wagons filled with donations and emergency relief. But Dolores can see the hypocrisy and she can tell exactly what these people truly feel about the citizens in the slums. She gives no answers but the three still decide to follow her along. She turns around and fakes a smile saying she will leave it to them. But as soon as the three enter the tent they are disgusted by the smell and fear ruining their own expensive shoes. They immediately regret their decision and they are concerned they might be infected next. Dolores knew this would happen and wants them to leave since they're only faking empathy for the sick and they don't have the qualities to want to sacrifice their own vanity for others and truly volunteer their kindness. Those are the things that are closest to God's grace. Dolores steps through the tent and goes to the most horrific one, the critical patient's tent. Everyone inside is in deep pain. She enters and sees Vakir working on one of the patients and the doctors are astonished. He's using divine power not on the skin but by opening a wound and letting it sink into the infected area. This technique requires an insane amount of focus and mastery of divine energy. Dolores is shocked that the night hound is capable of such things and is impressed with his skills in medicine. And we get some explanation on this power. To sum it up, divine energy is sending a prayer to God and once he accepts it, he gives back divine power to the individual. The amount of power given depends on how devoted one is to God. The amount is proportional to what miracle is needed to be performed. One divine power is one miracle and 10 equals 10. But Vakir knows the method to create 10 miracles with only using one divine power and 100 with only using 10. During the time of the demonic war, there were countless patients lying in front of the clerics who were outnumbered by the monsters. They knew the amount of divine energy they had wasn't enough to stop the invasion. This decision made by God was for the desperation and wavering faith of the clerics. Their powers surged and now the clerics could use all the power that they could muster, but it came with interest. It was a strange phenomenon called the advanced divine power. And in a time where killing monsters was an act of faith, even if one wasn't a cleric, they could still use divine power. Even someone like Vakir, who has a soul accumulated with karma from the past, can still use divine energy in a divine region. A girl begins crying for her mom, but Vakir tells her not to worry. He will treat her next. He hands her some food and tells the girl her mother is suffering from malnutrition and to feed her this. One of the priests tells Vakir that materialistic help is not permitted since the demands will never end. Even though there's a limit to how much money there is in Vakir's wallet, he is willing to give it to all of these people. He looks at the mother and apologizes in his mind and Dolores watches, wondering what he has to be sorry for. She thinks he has the same reason as her, he isn't able to treat enough people and feels guilt from that. 
For the first time in the saintess's life, someone right in front of her is causing her heart to beat fast. And bro, I swear, if Akira gets another girl on him, I'm gonna be so angry, bro. Just pick one, man. He takes off his mask for the first time in a while and takes a drink. Dolores approaches from behind and Vakir quickly places his mask back on, asking what she needs. She sits down beside him and asks to speak for a moment. She thanks him for his help and thanks to all his skills, they were able to treat so many people. Vakir just answers in the same cold tone as he usually does and Dolores tightens her grip. She comments on how strong Vakir is and he should have been born with divine power. And even the saintess was lucky to be born at all with her skills. But her body, mind, and faith aren't as strong. Why would God choose such a weak girl, she wonders, to be a saintess? There are so many people that have more faith than me. Why did God grant me this title? Vakir enlightens this girl by saying the very reason she feels guilt is the same reason why God chose her. The world needs a light that shines through the deepest crevices. Dolores sheds a tear wondering if she can be that light, but Vakir reassures her that she can. The outcome of the epidemic made the Quovatis family clergy gather and pray in one spot. And after that process was complete, the creation of holy water was successful. A divine substance that could cure an infected person with one drop. Three potions were created and the name is the Saintess Tears. Dolores stands in the church praying to Lun with her divine energy surging around her. The guards take her tears and place it inside of a box and they will store them in the basement safe. Dolores leaves to go meet her father. She has something to report about the Red Death. The father asks her to come forth placing his hand on her shoulder and he knows the large offering she made this time and is proud of his daughter. We are introduced to the Cardinal of the Lun Church, Humbert, and the man asks what his daughter found out. Due to some gossip from children saying that a certain well is cursed due to a spirit wandering around it, they are able to find the infected well, and also a dagger with the leviathan emblem. Humpert's eyes boil with rage, wondering how the leviathans created an artificial virus. How dare they insult the church of Lund. He stomps his foot down and declares a holy war on the clan. He tells his daughter that this so-called knight bloodhound is suspicious and orders his daughter to catch him right away and make him confess. But Dolores stands up to her father saying that he is innocent, even though we all really know that he isn't. Dolores continues that he spent every day and night treating the sick. There's no way he is evil. Humbert calms his nerves for his daughter who has never once gone against him to say this. He will really have to interrogate the bloodhound now. He lets out divine energy into the air, telling his daughter it's pointless to argue. He already sent the paladins after him. The men burst into his room, accusing him of being a suspect, but he is not there. A man comes rushing to tell the father that there is some grave news. On top of the bloodhound not being here, one of the saintess tears is missing. Dolores connects the dots and realizes that this was Vakir's goal all along, as we get a snapshot of him holding the bag. Thanking the holy city for helping him, but in the next instant, he vanishes. This chapter begins with a flashback of a young Ayan fighting a Cerberus with her barbarian brothers. As she's being pushed back to the edge of a cliff, she falls, and a quick note. This must be the Cerberus that Vakir killed in the beginning of the story. She was then captured by Imperials, speaking a language she could not understand. She was brought up as a slave and forced to fight crooked criminals and fiends. But even as a child, she had elite skill as she cuts around the neck of the brute she is fighting. But it is not enough, as her leg is grabbed and she's thrown into the side of a cage, making her cough up blood. This sparks laughter and entertainment from her captures, reveling in her pain, constantly laughing at her despair. She wishes to return home, and just a sliver of hope was enough for her to continue on. She got up and fought, but the days of being a slave weighed heavy on her mind. That is until Fakir came to save her. Ayan wakes up from that dream in the lap of her mother, worried about the nightmare that she just had. She knows how much Fakir means to her, and she is looking for him in his dream right now. Her chest feels tight, and her body is burning up. Maybe she has the Red Death. Her mother tries to comfort her by telling Ayan how she was born. The matriarch and Ayan's father had fun smoking some dope, literally what it says, and gave birth to Ayan after having some fun. But not long after, Ayan's father committed a crime and was executed by their grandfather. And hold up, how is this supposed to be calming? Ayan cries out, but Akila sums up her story saying, no matter what life throws at you, you need to live it. Just wait a little. When Vakir returns, everything will be alright. Ayan doesn't believe he will return, but a loud voice screams throughout the village that Fakir has come back, and he has the medicine. Akila looks to her child, but she already sprinted out of the tent, leaving Akila confused. Didn't she just say she had the Red Death? Ayan races towards Vakir, thinking of how it wasn't until he showed her how to face her fears was she able to conquer them. And thanks to him, she was able to stand back up 
and she rushes to the front, desperately looking for him, and she spots him. And Vakir says someone told him that she got the Red Death, but without another word, Ayan rushes to hug Vakir, launching him into the ground. Vakir just playfully says that if he didn't use some mana just now, she would have broke his back. And what's this about the Red Death? Are you sure you're okay? It seems like you're faking it. Ayan just smiles and laughs and welcomes Vakir back home. Most of the villagers are surrounding Vakir as he's treating to Ahul. He opens up his bag and the divine aura is emanating through the pouch. He takes out the saintess tears and the smallest drop is enough to cure the little barbarian. Ahun is lost for words, crying uncontrollably that his sister is finally cured. The villagers can't hold back their excitement, amazed at what Vakir managed to do. He looks towards Ayen asking how many more people they have that are sick and is told there's around 30. He also asks what about the other tribes and guesstimates that there's around 10,000. He orders Ayen to gather all the tribes around the riverbed. He says he has a lot of the medicine, so not to worry. The villagers are even further impressed that Vakir can cure everybody. And on top of that news, Vakir tells everybody that on his way here, he killed the swamp monster Ka and brought it back here as food. The villagers don't even know how to react, but they're even more impressed, shocked and screaming even louder at their hero. But he just calmly tells them there's no time. Grab the other tribes and meet him by the river. We shift to this meeting and we see all the different various tribes and clans of the barbarians meeting around him. He takes out the saintess tears and he drops the remaining portion into the river, cleansing it as far as the eye can see. He looks back and tells the leaders of the clan to quickly tell their people to drink this water. They are confused at first, but they see no other option. And as we see the barbarians going towards the river and drinking just a little sip, all of them are instantly healed. Their bodies feel lighter and the red death has disappeared. Fakir tells the mage shark that with this, the river is purified and they would not have to fear the Red Death no longer. The matriarch wants to appoint Vakir as the tribe's shaman, but he quickly declines. Suddenly, a man stomps the ground, creating a crater under his foot. He stands there with his arms crossed, and he yells for the people of the deep forest to listen to him. What is the name of the hero who purified our forest? All the barbarian men stomp their foot down and chant Vakir's name. What is the name of the person who saved our family? All the women and sorcerers begin chanting Vakir's name. Who is the person who brought upon a bright future for the deep forest? All of the barbarians start chanting Vakir's name, and the noise is so loud it rattles the surrounding forest. Vakir stands there absorbing all of the praise and thinks to himself that even a wicked deed that he committed by infecting a major city turned into a favorable situation. And now, in his new life, he has the backing of all the barbarians, and they're the natural enemy of the Baskervilles. Now that they owe him, it won't be impossible to fight the Baskervilles, and he can use this chance to land a huge blow on Hugo. The matriarch calls for a grand festival, but Vakir says there's one thing he has to do. They need to find the person who's responsible for spreading the poison. We go to the shaman's cave, and he's thinking to himself that a lot of time has passed already. Everyone should have been infected by now. He shouldn't have struck a deal with those imperial druggies, but this is all the brat's fault. The moment when everyone is in despair, the shaman will come with the antidote, so the whole tribe will have no choice but to respect them again. No one would suspect him of infecting his own granddaughter. What a great idea. He smiles to himself, thinking that his plan is perfect. He exits the cave and gets a harsh realization. Everyone is completely healthy, even Ahul. He was sure that they were grasping for air moments before, and the Red Death was plummeting them to their deaths. What is going on? There is no way. He goes to the riverbed, wondering how the fishes are even alive inside. And the water has gotten clearer. How? What happened? Vakir, in his typical fashion, appears right behind the shaman, telling him how the river has been cleansed. Ahumen turns around, calling Vakir an imperial bastard, thinking how did he appear behind him. But all of a sudden, all the barbarians gather, and they look at him with disdain. The person who spread the Red Death in the forest has expected it was you, Ahumen. In Vakir's past life, there was a time where he heard stories of an old man living in the forest, and his misdeeds were trending. It was a horrible story of a man who spread an infection within his own tribe to want to become a hero. But in turn, he couldn't even cure it and killed most of his tribe's people. And that was Ahuman. The old man grabs his chin thinking there's no way he knows. And just questions why everyone came to greet the old shaman. The matriarch approaches with her arms crossed asking if he finished the ceremony. He stumbles saying he did and the infection will clear soon. The matriarch said that she heard something about the empire declaring a war due to the Red Death. And this was because the infection was artificially created and spread. Isn't that strange? Between the Imperial Clan and Deep Forest, I don't really see a connection. Ahumen starts sweating, not knowing how to answer, saying that he only came here to do the ritual right. 
for the sake of the tribe's recovery. But he's immediately caught off guard when they ask him why he came here instead of the village. The matriarch turns to Vakir saying what he said was true, Ahumen really did come to the catchment area first. Let's see if the next thing he said will also come true. The matriarch stares down the shaman as he's quickly confused on what's about to happen, and we get a flashback on what Fakir said. He told the matriarch that a human wants to use this incident to become the tribe's hero, so he will definitely have it, the cure to the Red Death. The matriarch unleashes her killing aura and asks to see what's in his pouch. The man sweats beyond belief. This is up to date for the manhwa, so we're gonna have to come back once some more chapters uh, come out, but thank you guys for watching and I hope you enjoyed it.